Good evening. My name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, January the 21st, 2024. If you're not a regular attendee of our church in Northfield and you're wondering perhaps where the evening services have gone, uh, Jane and I were on vacation for a couple of weeks, so we're back and hopefully uh, we can uh, enjoy praising the Lord in song for taking the Lord's Supper and uh, hopefully I have a message that will be edifying and enlightening for all of you. We sing here at Northfield from Songs of Faith and Praise. I will give you the number and the name of the song. Just in case you don't have that book and you want to sing along, you can Google it, uh, find it in your own songbook, and we can enjoy singing praises to the Lord together. The first song that we will sing is number 51. It is entitled, Father of Mercies. Number 51, Father of of mercies. <clears throat> Father of mercies, day by day my love to thee grows more and more. Thy gifts are strewn upon my way like sands upon the great seashore, like sands upon the great seashore. Father of mercies, God of love, whose gentle gifts all creatures share, the rolling seasons as they move proclaim to all thy constant care. Proclaim to all thy constant care. Father of mercies, may our hearts ne'er overlook thy bounteous care. But what our Father's hand imparts, still own in grateful praise and prayer, still own in grateful praise and prayer. If you would turn to number 172, 172. Uh, the title of this song is I Just Came to Praise the Lord. Number 72. I Just Came to Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise his holy name. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to praise his holy name. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to love the Lord. And before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 705, A Common Love. 705, A Common Love. (coughs) 
A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. Let's sing it again. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. We come to the part of our service where we observe the Lord's Supper. We do this because we are have been instructed to do so. Acts the 20th chapter and the 7th verse says that they gathered together on the first day and they broke bread. And that means that they observed the Lord's Supper. This was the supper that was instituted by Jesus Christ on the night in which he was betrayed when he told his disciples to take bread and take the fruit of the vine. He uh, explained to them what they symbolized. And so coming forth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul uh, lets the Corinthian brethren know how they are to observe the Lord's Supper in almost exactly the same terms of what the body and what the blood and the fruit of the vine uh, represented. So as we gather about uh, the Lord's table, it's a very, very solemn time. It's a time to remember that in God's infinite wisdom that he sent his son in the form of man to be uh, a man on the face of this earth physically, but be endowed with the uh, spiritual uh, divinity of God that he was a part of. And so as we uh, 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 take part of these elements, help us to remember what they represent and why they are important to us. Let's pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we know that Jesus hung on that cruel cross of Calvary, that nails were driven into Jesus' hands, that they were driven into his feet, the other utter agony that that body must have felt as it racked with pain. But the important part for us is to remember that Jesus did that for each one of us. He gave up his body that we might live. So as we partake of this bread, help us to understand that this bread is representative of the body of our Lord as it hung on the cross. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we realize that the blood inside of our bodies is that which uh, delivers things to our body that helps us to live. And we know that that blood flowed from Jesus's head. We know that it flowed from his hands and his feet and it flowed from his side. And as that life-giving blood ebbed out of his body, uh, his life ebbed from him as a physical person. And so as we partake of the fruit of the vine, help us to remember the importance of the blood that Jesus said, shed, that it is indeed the blood of our salvation. It's the blood that washes away our sins, that frees us from the guilt of sins. Be with us as we partake. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen.
We are also commanded on the first day of the week to lay by in store uh, that which we have been prospered. Uh, that uh, doesn't mean that it's a 10th or a 20th. It means as we have been prospered, help us to remember how prosperous we indeed are. Help us with a good heart to give back to the Lord that which is his anyway. Uh, we pray that you would help uh, the leaders of the church to use these monies to spread the gospel, to use these monies to help those who are in need, as is what the church is supposed to be. Let's pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, let us give with a, an open heart and open mind and with a cheerful attitude, understanding what we give you but your own. Help us as we give back to understand that it should be a sacrifice, just as in uh, the days before Jesus came and the people sacrificed. They were supposed to sacrifice that which was the best. And as we give, let's give of our best back to the Lord so that the Lord's word work may be accomplished here on earth. Bless us in our giving. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we will sing is number 670. 670. The title is, O oh, for a Closer Walk with God. 670. O oh, for a Closer Walk with God. <clears throat> oh, for a closer walk with God, a common heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and His Word? The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only so shall my walk be close with God. Come and serene my frame. So purer light shall mark the road that leads me to the Lamb. Hope you enjoyed singing along with us in praising our Lord. This particular song is such a, an interesting and unique one, and it uh, tries to promote in our hearts and in our minds that we do indeed have a closer walk with God, because through Jesus Christ, uh, the roads have been lightened up for us, and those roads lead us to the Lamb. And the last verse of that song says, so shall my walk be close with God, calm and serene. So pure light shall mark the road that leads me to the lamb. We want to be led to the lamb. If you were attendant this morning at our morning services, uh, you knew that the title of my lesson this evening was Authority for God's People authority for God's people. Since God chose the children of Israel to be his people and called them his chosen people, 
He put an authority over them. He put an authority so that the people would understand that when he chose them, that he was to be their God and their only God. We know that uh, when the children of Israel went into the promised land, they were surrounded by nations and all of those nations had kings. Yet the children of Israel did not have kings. And so uh, we'll, we'll just address that just slightly in a couple of moments. And so what uh, God did in his divine wisdom was he appointed judges over the people. And why did he do that? Well, God is very succinct in his Holy Spirit-inspired word, in Judges chapter 21, verse 25. And here it is, and just boldly as can be. It says, in there, those days, there was no king in Israel. All right? And by the way, just I'll stop in the middle of that verse. God really didn't want them to have a king. As a matter of fact, Samuel explained to the people what would happen if they had a king and what happened to their neighboring uh, lands, their neighboring nations that had kings, and it would be no different. However, the people wanted one. And as we see the second half of this verse, it says, in those days there was no king. And it said, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And every time the people got to that point, God appointed a judge for them to get them walking in the direction that they are or were supposed to be walking in. If we fast forward to the New Testament, as Jesus ascended into heaven in the 28th chapter of the book of Matthew in the 28th verse, Jesus very, very pointedly said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. When judgment day comes, Jesus is the one who is going to be doing the judging because God has given him all authority. In the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, the apostle Paul writes, for I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel that was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was it, nor was it taught, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul lets them know in no uncertain terms that the word that he preached was Holy Spirit inspired. Now, if we go back to the Old Testament and we talk about laws and authority again, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 5, I'm going to look at the verses that surround these in just a little while. It says, See, I have taught you the statutes just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land you're entering to possess it. Do we get that? God provided statutes. He provided laws for them. And that would be the authority by which they would live. Now, if we fast forward to New Testament times, and you may remember this as a little part of the morning lesson, uh, even though we are not under the old law anymore, we are under a law. We're under the law of Jesus Christ. And each church is under the guidance of the Lord's word. But scriptural churches uh, have elders who spiritually guide, guide the flock, and deacons who are servants of the Lord. They all come with qualifications that are pointed out in uh, the New Testament. 
And while they were at Antioch, it says, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, if a church does not have uh, those that are qualified to be elders, uh, they uh, are to be guided by the word of God. Now, we are to be guided by the word of God anyway, but uh, that is uh, very, very, very important for us. So what about these statutes and judgments? In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, I read 5 just a moment ago. It says, But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. So I have taught you the statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Why were they a wise and understanding people? Well, I believe that they were a wise and understanding people because they kept the statutes of the Lord. Right? They kept the statutes of the Lord. In Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 to 10, the, the people rebelled verses 1 through 14. And um, I'm not going to read you all 10 of those verses, but suffice it to say, uh, the spies reported uh, what was going on in the land, and uh, uh, the uh, majority of the spies talked about how uh, the land was good, but it was inhabited by these giant people and they did not have a chance. But Joshua and Caleb, uh, who spied out the land, they came back and said that uh, if the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. And notice he says, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and Lord is with us. Do not fear them. All right. And so with that in mind, the, the statement here is explaining that it is only by the authority of the Lord and their belief in God that the land would be there and would be theirs. Now, so first, uh, authority of God's people is through statutes and judgments. Second, it is according to the word of God. In Leviticus 10 and verse 3, it says, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all people, I will be honored. God's word explained that to them, just as it was explained to them that they didn't need a king. Their God was their king. And so by those who came near, he explained to them that he would be holy and that all the people should honor him. Third, Authority for God's people was to be of one heart and one soul. We know that the early church, after those 3,000 were baptized, 
uh, got very close and they adhered to the apostles' teachings. And if we read Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 34, it says that they shared with each other. The believers shared with one another. When one was in need, they shared. Those that had were willing to share with those that did not have. Now, Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. As the Israelites under the old covenant were God's chosen people, this scripture from Titus explains to us that Christians are now God's chosen people who gave himself to redeem us from lawless deeds, to purify himself, a people for his possession. When we become children of God, we are God's possession through the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. And with that, we are to be of one heart and of one soul. I love this scripture from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 that says, While we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, this was written a few years after Peter preached that sermon and after uh, in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 that these people were sharing with one another, and it went on. It wasn't supposed to be just a one-time thing. It was supposed to be a part of the persona of Christians, that they were to do all good to all people. Now, why? Well, part of it is in when we, we had as a, a part of our service the, the offering in James chapter 1, verse 17, James says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Last on my list is about obey those who rule. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Our leaders are to lead with joy. They are to lead with with truth. Why? Because this is profitable. This is the way the Lord wants it. This is what the authority is for God's people. Finally, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 to 13, the Holy Spirit-inspired apostle Paul writes, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. One of the reasons that in his infinite wisdom in New Testament times that God wanted elders serving the church was that uh, they would guide the people in a spiritual way so that the people within God's church, his kingdom here on earth, would live at peace with one another. And so as we look at this lesson, which is yours right now, let's look at what we have covered. Authority for God's people. In the Old Testament, it was statutes and judgments. And in the New Testament, as we look at the New Testament teachings and the apostles' teachings, those statutes and judgments are still there. 
They are there according to God's word. God's word is the final authority as far as what God's people are supposed to say, what they're supposed to do. The Lord's church is to be of one heart and of one soul, sharing with one another, not just on a physical level, but on a spiritual level. When we attend Bible classes, we grow and we mature as we share with one another. And our teachers of those classes try to explain what the Lord's word says to us. And finally, when we obey those who rule, if we are from a church that has elders and deacons, we are to obey them. Why? Uh, because, according to Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, that we will live in peace with one another. Since the beginning, there has always been an authority for God's people. In Old Testament times, it was God himself. God sent prophets to the people to explain very often what he meant. However, in the New Testament, everything came through Jesus Christ. Jesus was the new covenant. And we are still under the law, but instead of being under the law of Moses, we are now under the law of the new covenant that Jesus died was buried and resurrected from the dead. I just pray that we will take this into our minds and into our hearts. I pray that all of you are children of God so that all of these things really mean something to you as far as the authority for God's people is concerned. If you're not a ch child of God, the scriptures point out very, very clearly about what we must do. We know that we must uh, hear and believe God's word. We know that we must repent of our former ways, confess Jesus as the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of our sins. If you need that, and you know and you have done and you have read and you have studied, we want to help you. We want to help you to become a child of God. Get in touch with one of us, and we will surely help you right where you are, when you are. I pray that this lesson was uh, uh, enlightening to all of us. Let's all pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the time that we've had together this evening. Help us to understand that you are our final authority, that just as uh, God was the authority for the Israelites as chosen people, God is still our authority today. We still serve the same God that the children of Israel serve. Yet we are now under a new co covenant that the Messiah, which the prophets explained to us would come, has come. He has done what he is supposed to have done. He's lived a holy and righteous life and he died for the sins of man. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, come to understand what is so important in our lives that uh, we are your children, we are your people, and you are our God. Bless us, be with us, comfort us when we need comforting. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name, amen. Please all of you be, be safe and may God bless you.